All right, um, so today we're going to be talking about operationalizing threat intelligence, um, which is kind of the core of why we're all here. Uh, threat intelligence is something that every company out there is struggling not only to just identify uh, and define, but uh, once they've managed to spend a couple of years it takes to do that, they're not sure what to do beyond that point. Uh, my name is Johnny Martinelli. I'm a uh, penetration tester and senior security consultant for Red Lake. Uh, with Lynn and like half this room, my guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's all of us back there. Uh, and I'm joined today by uh, Ricardo LaFosse, the, C, uh, the CISO for Cook County. Hello, and for the record, I do no business with Red Leg. I'm doing this as a favor. From a government pr perspective, there's no procurement going on here. I just want to make it very <laughs> clear. We just needed a little more wackiness up here. <laughs> <laughs> Has everyone seen uh, Ricardo's Power, uh, Power Rangers belt? I just need to bring that out. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yes. All right. Um, Whoa, that was a great transition. Now, there's like five of those. Nice. <laughs> so um, the way that, that I've been able to kind of narrow down what it, threat intelligence is and what to do with it uh, is kind of using the, the UDA standard. Who's familiar with the UDA standard? That's less than I thought. <laughs> That's good because we're going to go through it. Um, UDA is uh, kind of a, it's a rapid assessment cycle developed by military strategists that revolutionized combat engagement. So what does that have to do with what you're doing on a daily basis? Well, what you're kind of doing as de you know, defensive engineers or whatever you may be is uh, military strategy, basically. You're taking in information and you're deciding what to do with it. Uh, and it's called UDA because of the things you see at the top here. It's got four steps, observe, orient, decide, uh, and then action. And while that may mean one thing when you're being shot at by an adversary, uh, it can mean something completely different when you're being shot at by ad adversarial scanners, or malware, what have you. Um, we're going to kind of frame this within the frame of threat intel feeds, since that's why we're all here today. Uh, and so I'll give you uh, the basic rundown with each mean, and then we'll go into each in detail, uh, and then I'll probably go back and forth yeah, with Ricardo and we'll figure it out. So uh, the first step, observe. Um, here we're, we're kind of referring to the data that's coming in, your threat intel feeds, um, your, uh, the stuff that's coming in out of your SIM. Uh, basically the raw information that's saying, hey, here's some stuff that's happening somewhere. It may not actually have anything to do with you. It may not be anything that you care about, but it is, at the very least, a thing that is happening. Um, you pass that on to the orient phase, which is where you take the thing that's happening and you kind of massage it into something uh, that you're able to recognize, that your tools are able to recognize, uh, and able to uh, correlate with other things that you or your tools recognize. And then you finally pass that, and you make a decision once you've got all that set together once you've got contextual information applied to the data that's coming in uh, and then you're able to take action based on whatever decisions you have made. That's like the very short version of that. Um, I don't think I need to go into tons of detail on any of this because this is something that most of us do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so let's just walk through it here so we can get you all drinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first step in that, uh, observe. Like I said, it's it's what the observe step is going to be for most of you is just that automated information uh, that's coming in. You're going to physically be observing using, like I said, log files coming in for locally, threat intel feeds coming in remotely, uh, literally just absorbing and collecting data all into one place so that it can be observed. And it's, sometimes it's you observing it, sometimes it's your tools observing it, um, but it's it's largely unprocessed data. It usually has to be parsed, it has to be formatted, it has to have something done to it before it can really become useful. But it's a really important core step. You have to be observing in the first place. You have to have these feeds coming in or you can't do anything. You have to have this core ability to observe what's going on inside and outside of your network. Uh, so if you don't have your taps in place, you don't have all of your logs being sent to collectors and central aggregation points, um, you're not observing. You can't do any, th any of the following steps until you've at least got that step down. And that's where I see uh, a huge amount of our clients getting stuck is they don't even have that. They may be observing one or two things. They may say, yeah, I've got, I've got subscriptions to all these threat intel services, 
Um, but then at the same time, they're not actually monitoring what's going on, say, in their DMZ, so the threat intel feeds are worthless because they don't have anything to uh, correlate those two, and it's just kind of, well, we're trying, and it doesn't really work that way. Um, there's tons of data sources available, public and private. Uh, most of the threat intel feeds you see out there are going to be kind of the sticks or taxi formats. Um, those are two formats uh, defined by NIST for threat intel feeds, uh, and that's so that everyone can take them in in a specified format and be able to do something with them. It's so tools can be created that understand a standard format and be able to act from there. Um, one thing I really like to point out in this phase is uh, unprocessed data, this data that's coming in, even if it's coming in from your threat intel feeds, is not threat intelligence. This data is not intelligence, it is not intelligent. It is just data. It is only you who can actually turn that into intelligence that is relevant to your organization. You're the one who has to apply the context, context and determine what to do next with this data that's coming in. So again, even though it's called threat intel, it may not actually be intel to you. Anything to add to that? Yeah, so a key point with the threat intel uh, feeds and other third-party feeds is the type of data that's coming in. One issue is there can be a lot of dirty data coming in, and if you bring in dirty data, you're going to have dirty data within your sets. And sanitizing that data is very difficult once your data set has been not compromised, but tainted by dirty data. Actually point. removing it out of it is extremely difficult. So sanitizing as much as you can your data coming in is really key from an operational perspective. And again, going back to that it's not intelligence, having multiple sets and, and deduplicating the information and also aging it out is very key. So the data coming in can become very stale very quickly. So having those aging, um, or those timeout sets, uh, how you call it? Uh, age outs. Yeah, yeah, age outs is very key. Otherwise, you will be reporting and learning on data that's already stale and not worth to you. Yeah, that's, that's one of the key things to look at as soon as data is coming in, especially if it's from pu public feeds, especially from a lot of these open source feeds I see out there. Um, check the dates on those. Like, if you're, there's, I've seen some. Come from the Garmin, I get to yell at MSI sec. So. I was just going to say I don't want to call anyone out. <laughs> Go for I, it. <laughs> I will publicly call it MSI sec. I'm on the board, so I can make fun of them as much as I want. Um, they send out indicators they call indicators of bad IP addresses, bad domains on a monthly basis. By the time it gets to the individuals that are actually utilizing the data, half of it's already false positives and it's not very useful information. If anything, it's adding more work to the organization that's trying to utilize that data. So the timeliness of the data and the, as much integrity as you can get from the data is extremely, extremely important mm -hmm. with your threat intelligence program. Uh, and that kind of ties us into uh, orientation, which is that process of sanitizing the data uh, as far as this goes. That's really probably the most, maybe the second most important part of this. Uh, it does unlock the next couple of steps, and so without having good orientation of the data, you can't really do anything else. Uh, orientation here referring to uh, like the orientation at a company, getting the data into a shape that is appropriate for what your organization needs in order to take further action on it. Um, that's where you take the raw data that's coming in uh, and then implying the context of your organization and your security standpoint uh, and other various realms of knowledge that your engineers and your SMEs have available to them and then saying, yes, this is important. No, this is not important. This is really where that decision is made. Is this something I need to worry about? Is this something I don't need to worry about? That's what's going on here. And really, this, this is where all your filtering goes on. And you need to, like I said, you need to be figuring out what's important, what's not. And the more you can figure out is not important, the better, because the vast majority of the stuff you have coming in is not going to be important. That's just how it is, and it's because you're a tiny little speck in the yeah. grand scheme of things. And you're also likely not being targeted by that many uh, organizations. Uh, you're a little speck being targeted by little specks, but the threat <laughs> intel feeds are gargantuan, so a lot of it doesn't apply to you. Uh, don't get disheartened by the fact that most of the information you get in is useless to you. That's totally normal. That's just the nature of the beast. Don't be like, these. all of this stuff is useless. 
only one in 20 things that I get out of here is, it means anything to me. That's really normal. Um, it may be abnormal depending on your specific organization, so take that with a grain of salt, but for most situations and most, most organizations, a lot of the stuff isn't gonna apply directly to them. But it has to be you who takes your knowledge in that subject matter uh, and makes that decision. And also, take it into a phase approach. <clears throat> Threat intelligence is very different for every other organization. Know what you're trying to get out of the program. Are you trying to get real-time blacklist of IP addresses because that's what your tools can ingest? Know what your goals are from an organizational perspective. Like you said, there's tons of data coming in. What are your outputs from your data analysis? And you utilize that with your tools. You don't need uh, MD5s if you can't even search your logs for MD5 records. So don't take the whole ship. Break it off into little pieces and build your program in a, almost like a modular fashion. Because yeah. if you take on too much, your program will start stalling, it'll start failing. Take a phased approach to your program. It'll make you more successful. And like you said, it'll also make you feel better as you start parsing through this data and you get one hit out of 20,000. Yeah. You, you can actually use the data and the outputs from that information. That's a great point with the MD5s. You may be getting in data that's useless to you, like you said, the MD5s, because say your SEM isn't creating or ca uh, caching MD5s for anything. So you go, well, I'm just gonna mark all those as useless and, and keep moving on. Uh, you would also wanna mark that down as something for future expansion. You do want to be able to check MD5s. You just can't right now. So make sure that you've got a note somewhere on your back burner to-do list of start doing that in your SIM or your endpoint protection or what have you. Uh, so that you can then turn that back on in your threat intel feed and start utilizing that. Don't just completely write stuff off permanently as like, can't do that now, can't do it ever, bye. Uh, you're, you are maturing just as threat intel feeds mature, uh, and so make sure you constantly revisit what you've turned off because it's really easy to forget those things. Just like blacklisting an IP. <laughs> IPs are not permanently assigned to people, so you may end up accidentally blacklisting customers because you haven't checked your blacklist in a very long time. And it happens all the time. Yes. Don't feel this hard. <laughs> We, we block Amazon all the time, <laughs> all the time. So it, it's the nature of the beast. Um, um, <coughs> AWS instance gets compromised. You block legitimate websites that are on that same hosting platform. It happens. Being able to be agile and being able to adjust your controls based on the input either from your end users or from your tools is very key. Be very flexible, don't be stringent with your threat intel program. Uh, finally, once you've got all of the right data coming in, it's get, getting the right context supplied to it, and you know what is and is not important to you and why it is or is not important to you, you can take that, that information that is important and decide what to do about it. Um, it and that's, this is where things like your incident response plan comes into play. Um, you should have a plan for every possible situation that comes through here. Uh, but your plan has to be very vague at the same time. Um, it's really hard to write a specific plan for every single thing uh, that can come across, but what you do in that instance is you see your plan will say, well, you pass it along to this individual who then takes action on it. And then you put individuals into place who are knowledgeable in the subject matter and have experience in these realms and know what action to take about each little specific thing of, uh, that may come through here. Um, this is another critical thing that I see a lot of organizations struggle with. This is the, the, the part that takes a, a massive amount of headcount, depending on how much data you're collecting. Um, this is where managed security services, uh, services are going to help you a lot. Uh, they're going to take that pressure off of you. They're going to be able to filter through the level one and the level two alerts. Uh, and if you let them do basic incident response for you, uh, and really get you down to the things that are extremely important. These are gonna be your level three, your level four incidents that are gonna get passed onto your team quickly. Uh, and that's so you're not bogging your team down with the level one, level two garbage that uh, they don't have the time for. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you hit it right in the head. Tuning <coughs> is very key with the information. Tom, that's looking down right now. Tom, raise your hand. That's Tom. He, he works on our Intel team as long with Katie that's playing on her phone right now. In the front <laughs> but the issue is until you tune it you'll get a lot of false positives and till this day we're still constantly tuning I, I annoy Tom at least three times a week on how far are we on tuning this and we're still getting the false positives or worse our threshold still so low that we have too much data coming in 
and we want to get to that point where we have a small amount of alerts that we really need to investigate and the rest is just noise on the side or the automated tools are taking care of most of it because I'd rather have the automated tools take care of the low level stuff, block it, and the really important high indicators actually have real eyes look at them and investigate the issues. So I'm sorry, Tom. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great point. You, you should be automating the decision step as much as possible uh, because every false positive still requires a decision to be made that it is a false positive and nothing further should be done about it. Uh, and if you are getting next to no false positives, um, that probably means that you're not getting any alerts whatsoever, which is super strange. Uh, both situations are super strange. You should be getting most fal mostly false positives, yeah. I would say. I, don't, I, I have confidence in that statement. Uh, most of the alerts you're going to get through are false positives. Uh, if that's not the case, check out what's going on in your environment. Something is likely severely wrong. Uh, or, or your filters are too narrow. Right. I mean, that, that's probably it. I mean, that's a perfect point. Right. If I would walk in one day and have like 10 alerts, something's wrong. Right, Tom? Yeah. And then... <laughs> <laughs> Tom gets the first drink. The first shot of the swag bag. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if uh, and then even when you do have a false positive and you're quickly making these decisions like this is false positive, this is false positive, you've got a ton of those coming through. That's that that's means you need some tweaking. You that means you're probably not uh, getting the uh, taking care of your orientation phase properly. Uh, there or you should be dropping a lot of that stuff before it ever even gets to the decision phase. Why is this raising an alert? You probably have to look at your alert signatures and kind of tweak those a little bit so it doesn't flag on these things anymore. Uh, I see that a ton, so it, you should be automating that. Uh, and then eventually, once you get good enough, you can start automating your decision and action process. You can say, whenever these alerts come through, can we automatically confirm these are not false positives? It's yes, what can I do from there? Can I pass this on to another tool that can then take action? Like if I can confirm with 100% certainty that this endpoint is infected with XYZ, can I pass this on to our NAC system to automatically cut that system off the network to block that MAC address uh, and then uh, alert the user to call the help desk to have that, that unit reimage, something like that. Always be figuring out how to further automate and that's going to again reduce the, the huge headcount you need to deal with the massive amount of information you have coming in. Uh, yes sir. Yeah. One hundred percent. That's your target level. It's the old, you know, perfection is not attainable, but you should always strive for it. Automate, automate, automate. As new new tools come out, more automation is available. That's that's pretty much the purpose of like every new tool I see coming out in the security space is automation. That's the primary selling point. When that salesperson comes to you, the primary thing they're pushing on you is. Here's how many hours we're going to take off of your hands, uh, off of your engineer's hands. Here's how many FTEs we're going to free up by you plugging this blinky box in. That's the whole point. And so whenever you're looking at new appliances or new tools or whatever, think about how can I tie this into my orchestration? How can I use this to further advance my automation? Sometimes you're going to find that this thing, while useful, it still leaves a massive gap between where you're at and what that thing can do. And that thing might just end up causing more noise in your environment. So don't always be jumping on the cool new tool that comes out just because it by itself can do cool new things. Those cool new things may not be applicable to the maturity of your environment. Definitely always follow that, that automation, orchestration, automation, orchestration circle. Uh, and that's going to help you through this whole decision realm that normally takes up a ton of time. No, I, I think you hit it right ahead again. Uh, automation is key. Why are you here? I know. <laughs> For the belt, that's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, the automation is extremely key. Uh, all the new tools nowadays, if they don't have some sort of integration with either a, a blacklist feed or a sticks and taxi feed, should you question the maturity of the product itself? Um, one strategy we have moving forward of any new technologies, if it doesn't integrate with our ecosystem, if it can't plug into our anomaly feed, there is your free plug. With the anomaly feed, um, we don't need any more one-off solutions. Even though the point solutions could be great, if they don't integrate with our ecosystem, if the sim can't have 
uh, if it can't be fed into SIM, we can't create reports off of it. What's the real value outside of its protection capabilities to bring it into the automation scheme? We r run a pretty lean shop, and automation is a, one of the key features that keeps us afloat, keeps us moving forward. Speaking of, of actually anomaly flight that made me think of something, I wanted to drop right back here. Um, I just found out that a lot of the threat intel solutions that are out there don't allow you to specify your own tips, uh, your own threat intel feeds, uh, and that just blew my mind. Like you should be able to not only supply your own, but turn the ones that are uh, inside of the appliance or whatever product, whatever it may be, on and off based on what's providing good data, what's providing bad data. Um, I apparently most products don't leave, allow you to do that, and that just seems insane to me. Like you should absolutely be able to provide more feeds that you find on your own that are very applicable to you, not have to create your own solution just because the one you bought isn't doing what you need. Uh, so make sure that you have that available to you. Make sure you can always provide more feeds and then get rid of the ones you don't. Um, I'm so happy you put those transitions. In. Right? Yeah. I just like clipping through these. This is fun, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you guys try it later. <laughs> uh, and finally, once you have a decision made, and again, that decision's not necessarily made by you or your engineers. It, it's often, hopefully, most often made by uh, a technology that you own because you've automated that entire process. You have to determine, uh, you have to act, and you have to determine what that action is. Um, and th this is another sticking point for a lot of organizations. Like they're able to say, yes, this is a problem, uh, and yes, we need to do something about this, and then they don't have what that something is. Uh, again, uh, a lot of organizations that I come across don't even have a basic incident response plan in place. And your incident response, or they have one that's, that's like tower heist, scenario <laughs> incident response like what do we do if someone drills a hole in the roof of our data center and yeah. lowers Tom Cruise in uh, but they don't have like they it, it, <laughs> he's very good at what he does but they don't ha have uh, <laughs> but they don't have a basic plan for like what do we do with just infected endpoints like someone's got some ransomware in their endpoint what do you do in the case of ransomware do you pay or do you does who makes that decision? Like, should every ransomware infected endpoint go right to the CIO because the CIO is the one who has to say, yes, we're gonna take money out of the budget to buy Bitcoin to pay off this ransomware? Or uh, what do you do for just like a basic, like garbage malware infection? Like, is your decision like, yep, yeah, uh, uh, re-image all machines no matter what? Or do you attempt to clean based on level of the individual who's the owner of that machine? Like, this is how your incident response plans have to look. Uh, they don't, but, don't get too crazy granular. Don't put people's names in them because that's highly inappropriate. This has to, to be appropriate for the full context of anything you can come across, uh, and it has to last longer than any single employee is gonna be at that company, and I just see so many people getting stuck at that point. See, I got nothing this time. Uh, nothing, okay. Yeah, so acting, it seems like a dumb thing to call a step, but it's, where we see, again, so many people getting stuck, so many people can't act or they act inappropriately. Um, wait, while wait and see what happens is, yes, an action, um, you have to go back and then reevaluate that situation. You can't just you know, say, accept the risk of like, well, it's not too infected. It's all right. Well, just leave it alone. <laughs> I mean, that's your call. If you want to accept that risk, but yeah. Um, I will add one thing. Okay. So this is a grueling, horrible process. As I'm gonna look at Tom again because this is his <coughs> day in day out right now. A lot of the work is grueling, tuning out everything out, building out these workflows Don't for those scenarios. Grueling. Like some people find that really fun. Like automated. See, so look at like, him. shaking his head. No. Right. No. Well, we're not all Toms. <laughs> I'm a Tom. I like. I, I find it <laughs> grueling. I, I. Fine. It's laborious process. How about that? <laughs> But the, the more you put into it, the, the tuning, building out those workflows, once you get past that hump, you, then you have this nice plan that 85% of the time will be automated. If you get the alert, if it's a ransomware variant, automatically isolate, isolate with a NAC, send a ticket to the service desk, have a technician come out. Having that automated first saves lots of time and hours, but the upfront work pays off dividends. So I will re-emphasize the importance of having that process ironed out and developed within your organization. Mm -hmm. But you cannot account for every single scenario. You have to have like buckets of, 
of categories. Malware, and then you could break it down to possible ransomware or worms or extortionware, <clears throat> so on and so forth. How many have an in-house SOC, even if it's two people, like in-house SOC? Uh, how many of you with an in-house SOC also use an MSS service? Kind of all of them. <laughs> um, is it because your in-house SOC was absolutely sick of all the, the false positive level one alerts that came through there? No. What? Just <laughs> oh, okay, off hours. Yeah, is your sock absolutely sick of all the level one alerts that false positives that come through? Yeah. Um, does your MSS take care of tuning of whatever's generating those alerts or the SEM that's, you know, generating the alerts? Uh, that's that's something you should be looking into when, if you're hiring on an MSS to take care of that. And make sure that they're able to take over that tuning process because otherwise it's just going to be the same garbage. And now you're paying someone else to just deal with garbage, and they're actually not doing anything all day. And you have to tune their tuning as well. Mm -hmm. So make so sure you can't completely offload no. the tune. No, because nobody but but you or somebody who works within your actual enterprise and has that contextual knowledge of what's really going on can do proper tuning yep. uh, of your appliances. Make sure you're doing that proper tuning. Um, that's that's critical. That's key. Because otherwise, what happens? Like even if you go well, a ton of alerts is better than no alerts, which is very true. Um, you're going to get burnt out. You're going to stop pay, giving the priority to any alerts. Uh, and then that's when you get hit. Yeah, that's yep. when you get hit. That's when your building starts on fire and then you go, well, this is fine. <laughs> that's, that's what that is. Uh, so make sure you're constantly tuning as part of your action. Tuning is an action. I have too many false positives and these mean nothing. You've made the decision that this means nothing. Your action is tune it so that that happens less. And that's yet another uh, critical point to see people failing at. Uh, so overall, that's that's the UDA standard. Um, tried to kind of break it down and make it apply to InfoSec and uh, hopefully to this room. I think it worked. Yeah, I think that's going to be it. All so right. Once again, thank you, Anomaly, for having us here.